maybe while we're waiting for people to come to the microphone, I think we're all ready, but yeah. um, maybe uh, people want to comment on, you know, we've heard various approaches to implementation of uh, genomic primarily profiling for, uh, for clinical trials. So how much do we need to worry about uh, intra-laboratory uh, and inter-laboratory variants? And what would be the best way of going forward as far as, you know, one laboratory, can several laboratories do this? Maybe you could comment on that. So I think it's a very important question. Uh, we are fortunate to have a grant that's actually funded by, it's, it's funded by both the NHGRI and the NCI we're, that's supporting this perspective exome sequencing study that we're doing. And uh, the part of the consortium, the, the part of the charge of the consortium is to think carefully about sequencing standards that could be cut across uh, various types of platforms and, and approaches. So the idea, uh, I'm sure most of you in this room know that just because something is done in a CLIA lab doesn't automatically mean that it's done at high quality. It just means that it's done the exact same way every single time. So we're trying to, um, to think carefully about what does it mean uh, to have uh, st metrics of uh, not only depth of coverage, but are all of the mission critical exons coverage in, in uh, genes that are of clinical importance and uh, how to come up with a, a nomenclature and a language that cuts across whatever platform or whatever um, approach or sequencing instrument or what have you uh, is being used so that there can be standards that are put out there and considered objective. And part of that could include the use of, uh, for example, uh, common mixtures, whether it's uh, cell lines or HapMap samples or what have you, that everybody runs their approach on so that there's an objective uh, comparator to the performance and at least, or at minimum, uh, exceeding certain standards that are needed clinically can be developed. So I, I'll just take a different uh, sort of take on what Levi said, sort of complementary, is that I, I think that we shouldn't be as concerned as we are about the accuracy of, of biomarkers in the context of early stage clinical trials. I think we need to be very concerned about this question for drugs that are approved um, and that are on the market and are standard of care. But I, I do think that there needs to be a lower bar, and you can decide how low that lower bar needs to be, um, for investigational drugs that are on that are part of an investigational clinical trial, oftentimes in patients who have no other treatment options. And actually, I was very curious as to what John said there at the end. I've actually never heard that interpretation um, where maybe we don't need an IDE uh, in the setting of, of those trials, because that's not the guidance we're getting. But again, I, I, I think that HER2 testing um, sort of brought this to the forefront in large part in that there were inaccuracies in the community, um, even at ac academic medical centers for an approved drug. Um, but the risk-benefit ratio that I see um, is very, I, I don't see any risks, honestly, in the trials that we're running um, in patients with advanced metastatic cancer, um, who typically, at least in my clinic, have an, a life expectancy uh, of less than a year. So um, I'm thinking back to uh, our early days when we, we uh, began to learn what was driving sensitivity to EGFR TKIs. And I think there are a number of us in the field who I think the field was set back substantially by misinterpretation of things that were mutations that were actually well-known uh, artifacts uh, in, uh, you know, in those who are well-versed in labs surrounding uh, mutation status, the EGFR fish, the EGFR IHC story. And that did set the field back. And here we are, you know, nine years later, we still don't know the best drug for acquired resistance. So I, I think just at a high, you know, a high level, I'm a bit more uh, uh, aligned with, uh, you know, the, the developing some, at least some, even if multiple platforms are contemplated, a common playing field with minimal criteria. For example, the type of uh, validation approaches we showed for an NGS platform or that others may think about for for other platforms. In the, in the example of, you know, comparison with sequinome, we did a very robust uh, comparison with them and presented that at AACR and showed tremendous concordance amongst the drivers and just a few, few outliers that were generally well explained by sampling different parts of the tumor. Yep. <clears throat> Bob Diazio, Mayo Clinic. Uh, just a comment and uh, a question. Um, first of all, the comment, I think uh, both of these are, are actually the first three presentations uh, 
illustrate very well uh, the possibility of, of doing those nimble phase two studies we referred to, as opposed to these large phase three studies. These are well um, suited studies to be able to uh, begin to uh, get molecular information uh, in the clinical arena. Uh, the question is, um, and, and I guess it's for David, uh, I'll start with David, uh, with regard to uh, uh, while, it, while certainly you can move to uh, the clinic quickly, as, as you've suggested, but curious whether you've used animal models at all um, to uh, test uh, the implanted tumor in, uh, in a nude mouse uh, or whatever to attempt to study, particularly when you're dealing with uh, tumors that may share a mutation, but where there may be many hills that take a while to prove the, uh, um, the concept, the therapeutic concept of, of, of uh, basically uh, overcoming those hills. I mean, I'm a big advocate of uh, preclinical studies. That's, that's what my lab does um, in large part. Uh, but I think in the end, the ultimate is in the clinic. And I, I think that what Absolutely. the extraordinary case experience has, has told me is that we've seen a lot of unexpected things. Um, and I think most of the cancer drugs, for example, have been discovered um, based upon clinical observations. Patients with unusual cancer syndromes led to the discovery of almost all the tumor suppressors that we know. And surprisingly, I think we find that, that there are cases where the preclinical models just turned out to be not that accurate um, in predicting why patients are going to respond. And we really need to take advantage of these cases when it, when it happens. Um, but I, I think in the end, um, you have to be able to do the iterative um, clinical trials. And but right uh, now we're again, being held up by Again, just to clarify yeah. what I was asking, uh, it's actually using the human tumor in the animal model setting not an animal model. Yeah, so things like tumor graphs, and uh, it's just, it's very expensive, expensive so right. it's hard to scale. Um, and there are companies that are trying to do that, like Champion. So uh, we, um, one of the things that we are endeavoring to put into place, we haven't quite succeeded yet. It's, it's not quite exactly what you're asking. It's not um, taking the tumor sample and putting it in a, into a mouse. I mean, one of the risks there is, that, you know, if you have to wait for that to develop and then do a, mini trial, the patient is progressing. and But one thing that we are doing is uh, putting together a small team of people. We were calling it the, the, the VUS SWAT team. I'll tell you what that stands for. So VUS stands for Variance of Uncertain Significance. So very commonly, what you get when you sequence exomes or targeted gene panels is a tantalizing mutation. It's a, and typically, it's a mutation in a, an obviously druggable gene. You know, it's in a kinase for which there's a drug out there in clinical trials, but we've never seen the mutation before. Uh, so you, you, you're drawn to it because you want to give the drug, and, and particularly if there's nothing else that turned up in, in, the, uh, in the assay. But we don't really know if it's just a passenger, it could just be a passenger event. So we're trying to set up a, a group of people who can take various uh, rapidly, rapid turnaround kind of in vitro models where you can uh, quickly engineer the clone, bomb it into a BAF3 cell, and do a quick uh, assay for is it activating or, you know, even just the little hint of something that would tell you, okay, this is actually, uh, this was a biologically consequential event. So it, it th may throw you over the bar to think about using uh, that therapy uh, when, you know, so if you, if you saw it at the point where a patient was getting another therapy, you might have a chance to do that. Now, this is way out there. I'm not saying that cooperative groups should do that, but uh, this is something that the, the variants of uncertain significance are going to be an issue. Uh, so this is one of the ideas that we're playing around. And with. if I could just ask a, a quick point of clarification, uh, David and Vincent both mentioned uh, sequinome-based test and when the patient failed the sequinome-based test, but you didn't say what you were actually testing. Are you using uh, a standard sequinome uh, panel of genes to uh, evaluate up front uh, either mutations in uh, specific uh, uh, genes? The, the sequinome test at Sloan Kettering, um, which is uh, being phased out at this point um, for a next gen uh, sequencing assay, just looked at hotspot mutations in eight genes. And so when we in the past had seen these uh, in extremely interesting cases, that was the best we had available um, to try to figure out what the molecular um, profile of those tumors were. And I think what you've seen just over the last two years, this just really was not feasible five, ten years ago. Mm -hmm is that you can either do a capture-based assay, um, like Vince is talking about um, from foundation, or even whole genome or whole exome. Um, and 
the sequinome, again, we did as a best compromise available at the time. Great. Just to add, even in, in the lung cancer world now, since the time that we did the 60 mutations in eight genes, we now have arguably four separate fish tests we need to do. And the worst situation we placed in as the clinician is we only have two slides left. Which one do you want me to do? It's Russian roulette. Right. The other thing is true. We, I completely uh, identify with the scenario Levi outlined that on each report we send out, there are an average about seven variants of unknown significance because of the commercial test, it's, it's not plausible to ask the doc, oh, can you get a tube of blood and go through the consenting process while you send in the tumor specimen? That being said, in a variety of initiatives, we hope to you know, obtain greater insight into that, and I'm sure there's some pearls therein, as, as Levi outlined. Great. Thanks. Peter Adamson, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. A couple of related questions on the, on the basket trial. And I may have missed it, but to fill the baskets in the example you gave, how many patients do you actually have to screen? And well, you can answer that and then I'll follow up. No, no, I think that's the most important question because my hope is if I can get anything across at this meeting, it's that my hope is that we're going to screen none. Um, we're, we're simply going to let the entire country screen the patients in whatever way they choose um, and then identify the patients. And I would say it is feasible in the sense that um, if you look at Vince's slide, um, he has identified more BRAF-altered patients than we have put on any of the basket studies of BRAF. And so that, that highlights a disconnect between patients who are actually getting their tumors genotyped. They're identifying that they have BRAF mutations, but they're not ending up on the study. And maybe they're not ending up on the study because they don't know about the study. Maybe they're not ending up on the study because they're in a part of the country where the study is not available. So I, I, I think it's a simple math question and as far as who's doing it. Um, putting that aside, how many patients will get screened somewhere to fill the baskets? It's just well, I'm, for I'm example, the colon basket was very easy. It got filled in about a month um, because about three percent of colon cancer patients who have metastatic disease, much lower than in the primary cancers, have BRAF mutations. Um, and since colorectal cancer screening for BRAF has actually become commonplace in, at many institutions. Many institutions had plenty of BRAF colon patients to put on the study. So it literally got enrolled um, overnight. But then we're also seeing a, a different phenomenon in that we'll have a, a situation with the erdheim chester syndrome, as an example, which is uh, non-Langerhans histiocytosis, where um, we've seen a major response in that tumor. Um, the trial's open to those patients, and we're actually finding those patients are seeking the trial out. Um, they have a well-organized advocacy net network. Um, uh, there's not that many of them, and they find out, okay, 51% of patients with that condition have a BRAF mutation. They can get the drug free of charge if they go on to this study. Um, and so it is possible um, to enroll it. And the question is, how many, how, what kind of study can you ultimately do? We think we can enroll 15 patients and maybe tell you a response rate in those 15. I don't think you'll ever do a randomized phase three study, um, but you know, we'll at least give you a response rate in some tens of numbers of patients. And the, the related question, um, if I heard correctly, you said the this, this study is never designed to get an FDA indication. Um, so I guess my question would be, why would industry want to partner uh, with you? I think you're looking for that first uh, single indication as to whether the drug has activity. And if, if you, for example, saw in a condition that has no treatment options, and that's what, for example, Erdheim Chester syndrome is, um, you saw a, a 60 or 70 percent response rate, which is what we've seen in other cancer types with BRAF inhibitor therapy, where you have a BRAF mutation. Um, I think the first 15 patients would tell you, okay, this is worth moving forward with, um, that it's a good compound that has some clinical activity and probably should be moved forward into a study where there's an FDA approval type of endpoint at the end. But that's not the purpose of this first study. The, fir the purpose of this st study was to show where the single is. And we saw that with colorectal. In colorectal, nobody responds, essentially, um, who has a BRAF mutation. So it, it, it's a single finding study. Um, and it, it allows you to then decide which cancers should move forward to the next step. I would think in the, in the ultra rare populations, it, it's possible that the data could be useful. I don't disagree with you, but I'm not going to say that. And it would have to, to see how rare it is, you know. We've been deftly avoiding Dr. Pazder over there. <laughs> so
So this is Richard Pastor, FDA. Uh, so the answer to your question is yes, it would, especially in a disease that you just pointed out where there's a very small population of patients that could benefit from a drug and a randomized study would be near impractical. We would take a look at a response rate and look at the toxicities of the drug and, and call it quits after a while and say, yes, it's approved for this indication. I think that's a lot easier to do with a drug that's already on the market, maybe for another compound. We already have a lot of safety data um, with the compound. Um, the trickier part, I think, is going to be um, also in these tumors uh, or mutations where the drug is not approved anywhere, um, but it looks very promising in some narrow group, and that's going to be much more challenging because you're going to have to treat enough patients to even know what the safety profile is. Uh, it's more of an issue as there are other existing therapies that come into play. I think that's much more of an issue, uh, that one has to balance out what you're seeing in the small subgroup versus what you're seeing with existing therapies. Obviously, uh, even if you have uh, a, a drug that has, you know, even an, a common tumor but that has an exceedingly high response rate, I think we would take very kindly a, a, a look at that, especially with an accelerated approval in that indication. But for a rare disease, um, we, we in general has taken a very liberal policy, even when it comes to the characterization of safety in that subgroup, because it simply cannot be shown. Just if we have one more comment I can make before, just is that I, I just wanted to make sure, because none of the, the speakers actually mentioned it, that about half of patients with cancer still get absolutely no molecular profiling whatsoever. Um, you know, we do this in lung cancer and colon cancer now routinely and in breast cancer for HER2, but the, the other half of cancers, there's no standard that we do even, even one test. That's only at academic centers. If you look at the Julie Lynch work from Dana Farber, there were single states where no one had an EGFR test a few years ago. So it's just a bit demoralizing. Uh, Rich Shilsky, ASCO. So I just want to sort of follow up on this discussion that's been going on um, uh, because it seems to me that, uh, you know, we've seen multiple examples now where the genomic profiling is becoming, you know, more readily available and undoubtedly you know, through the efforts of many people in this room, it will become widespread in the not too distant future. Um, I think what, in fact, is becoming a bigger obstacle to delivering the optimal care to patients is actually getting the right drug. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a bit off topic from this particular panel, but I wanted to throw it out in this context for all of us to be thinking about because, you know, whether it is developing basket trials or whether it is um, you know, enabling a clinician to get a drug off-label that is suggested to be potentially beneficial to a patient by a test and so on. I mean, doctors are scurrying around now, uh, left and right, trying to find drugs that are suggested by these tests, um, you know, whether it's for purposes of a clinical trial or for off-label use. So it seems to me that, you know, one of the things that we need to think about collectively is whether or not there's an opportunity for us to you know, put together some sort of a virtual oncology formulary um, whereby, you know, if there is, um, you know, a test that's been performed, um, you know, in a, in a CLIA lab, an analytically validated test that suggests a particular course of action with a particular agent, that um, it actually, there, there actually is a mechanism by which um, that agent could be made available um, to treat a patient ideally in a clinical trial, but if not in a clinical trial, then through an off-label mechanism that is potentially reimbursed through some coverage with evidence development mechanism or so on. It would require, I think, linkage to an outcomes registry, um, but if we had a, you know, on oncology formulary of this type linked to an outcomes registry, um, we could generate lots of valuable data that I think would be uh, valuable to patients, valuable to doctors, valuable to payers, and valuable to pharma, uh, and, you know, potentially also useful to regulatory authorities. So, um, so I, I hope we can give some thought to that. Yes, yeah, so let, me, let me follow up because I think it's very relevant to the, to the audience we're, we're speaking to here today. I mean, there's been a lot of talk about somehow coming up with a design where there's an umbrella of basket studies, um, which would allow um, one of these studies in a modular way to be, to be brought out to a network um, as part of a cooperative group or some other um, large network and um, without requiring it to go through each individual IRB for each disease. Um, and the key benefit here, again, as, as you mentioned, would be the collection of data. 
Um, because I think we focused on the positives here, but the negatives are important as well. Um, a case with BRAF where it's probably going to be negative is this K601E mutation, which is um, found in BRAF. It's a hotspot mutation. It's activating, but doesn't seem to be sensitive um, to bemurafenib um, in the laboratory and in the small number of patients that are treated. So we want to be able to capture this data. And if patients are just being treated ad hoc in the community based upon a commercial laboratory giving them that result and, and no data is then being disseminated, other patients with the same mutation are not going to respond uh, as well if, if it turns out that we're going to see that, that recurrent pattern. So we need a new design um, to do this, and we need a group that's willing to, to lead that effort. And I think we've got to keep the cost down and the sort of approval into any specific location um, very easy. Um, so that, that this can provide access to the drug. Just, just one other follow-up point, I mean, because I agree completely. I mean, you know, my guess is that there are multiple institutions and groups in this room that are all trying to develop basket trials, umbrella trials, something like that, which undoubtedly means that, you know, that every pharmaceutical company that has a portfolio of targeted agents is getting multiple phone calls every day from multiple investigators, you know, wanting to line up drugs for similar studies. Uh, and so... Um, you know, it seems to me that, to some extent, one way forward is for the drug companies, uh, the, regula the regulatory agencies, uh, and the payers, um, together with the investigative community, to sort of all get on the same page here and say, you know, we're going to have what I'm calling a national formulary that would, um, you know, enable these types of studies to be done in a highly efficient way. Um, you know, and if these were supported, of course, with a central IRB that was fully independent, where basically, you know, you could submit your biomarker test result, um, have it be adjudicated as being, you know, sort of a, a valid test result to suggest uh, an appropriate therapy, and then get that drug made available to your patient um, if it's in a clinical trial with, uh, you know, a, an approval from a central IRB to actually enroll the patient. Um, you know, we could really move things much, much more quickly, I think. I mean, it, it's a great vision, and there are pieces of it that are starting to bubble up. I mean, there are, there are ideas of this whole idea of central registries where people will uh, consent to uh, having their uh, extensive genetic data deposited uh, with appropriate, um, you know, constraints around access to data, but there's annotation so that, so that there's a large, you know, many, many uh, sites will deposit uh, data and, and annotation into clearing houses. There are individual pharma companies that are trying to come up with a way to have much more direct um, uh, abilities to, to make drugs available to uh, community oncologists who want to enroll patients uh, having generated profiling. So it, there are pieces, and I guess part of the question becomes how does one consolidate it? Probably there would need to be some funding source because you're right, in the near term, uh, making the drugs of either, either Either pharma decides we're just going to do it, or there's a way to, to reimburse uh, that, that and maybe other components of the cost as a grand feasibility, but it's a great vision. Uh, George Sledge, Stanford. Uh, a follow-up on the, uh, the basket study discussion. Uh, the basket studies are, are wonderful if you're looking at 1% of colorectal cancer with one kinase to be inhibited. But that's not cancer. I mean, I mean, cancer, those smart cancers don't have one kinase activated. They have multiple kinases activated, and most of them are low frequency. So what, how do we study those combinations? Because, uh, you know, I mean, to give an example, there was a paper published in Nature last year that looked at 100 breast cancers, found 40 drivers in 73 different combinations and most of those drivers were low frequency. How do we design that clinical trial system that, that deals with that real biologic reality? So I, I think it's a great question, and I, I would comment uh, in one way uh, by saying that I think there's some targets that we don't need a basket study for. We definitely don't need a basket study to do KRAS mutation in pancreas, because KRAS mutation in pancreas is almost all pancreas. So um, that's in that case, the challenge has not been finding these rare patients. The challenge is we don't have a good drug to inhibit KRAS mutation um, in pancreas. Um, what I've been amazed by um, as I've been doing these extraordinary cases that's, is that sometimes the co-mutation pattern causes resistance, and sometimes it, it doesn't seem to. And I think that the only way to study that is to start getting patients on drugs and having their molecular profile and starting to sort that through clinically. I don't think that we can do this completely in the laboratory 
I think we have to do it in the clinic. Um, so I think the basket concept is something that, that addresses one issue of these rare genotypes um, across many tumor types, but it doesn't clearly address many other uh, patients who have five or six drivers who might need combination therapy. And I think that's sometimes where the discussion gets out of hand. We start with, okay, let's, doing a, let's do a BRAF um, basket study, but then someone says, well, sometimes there's BRAF plus PI3 kinase, so don't we want to have an, an option for those patients to do a combination? Well, that, that's, that's very rational scientifically, um, but we don't have safety data for the combination, so we really can't use it yet. But first, we just need to get the single agent. And then if we find that all the patients with dual mutation of PIK3CA and BRAF don't respond, then we need to start looking into that combination. And it's possible that we're going to be fragmented down to a very tiny number of patients for all this. And, and, if, and maybe that's just the reality of cancer. It's going to be a, a whole host of, of orphan diseases. And maybe we need to do immunotherapy because then the genotype doesn't matter. I don't know. But I do think that, that we could capture some low-hanging fruit here and, and help a lot of patients in the short term just by, uh, you know, addressing this concept in some patients. Let me so just, just one. Oh, I'm sorry. Just, one, one quick comment. I mean, we're generating a tremendous amount of molecular information, and that molecular information will be able to inform pharma and others how, in part, to design their trials. So, for example, if you asked us, well, BRAF alone isn't determining the outcome of all the colon cancers or all the melanoma, we can line up the second, third, and fourth most common coexistent genomic alterations, the most common triplets, et cetera, and then say, all right, there's not a trial for everybody, but I can tell you from having looked at the data, 80% of the patients could fit into a forearm study of a doublet or triplet. So just to take my stab at, I think it's a great question. So a big part of what our lab has been doing over the past few years has been on the genome discovery side and discovering various new driver genes and cancers. And I have to say, it's, it's still humbling how little we know. Uh, I mean, there, there's a lot of great discovery, but uh, our ability to put it together and sort of categorically make predictions, I mean, we, we're focusing all of our conversation on the, you know, the 1% of the 1% kind of thing. Uh, but so th that, that's a prelude to say that I, I, I think that the phenotype to genotype side of the equation is, uh, it sometimes gets lost because it's much more appealing and rational and positivist to pick the mutation that we're going to target. But actually, the phenotype to genotype that says, okay, we're, we're, we're going to have to say we have no idea, uh, you know, how to use most of the driver genes, but, you know, we do know we're, we're going we're gonna to allow some attention to, uh, to just treating cancer with new drugs or even, you know, new combinations of existing drugs as part of the story and discover, try to discover what, common, what genetic or molecular features end up being predictive because we just at least this slice in time, our knowledge of biology is still relatively amoebic. Uh, so I think we need to kind of balance the, the genotype to phenotype uh, basket trials, et cetera, with still allowing ourselves to discover what the, the, the uh, predictors are going to be without prior knowledge because we're, we're still pretty ignorant. All right. Well, yeah, right. One more. Uh, Roy Herbst from Yale. So uh, to follow up on that, so we've spoken a lot about genes in this section and, and driver genes, so I would wonder your thoughts as to how many more of these we're going to find with all the sequencing and all the TCGA, TCGA that's been done. I wonder how many more driver genes there will be. We haven't heard a lot about proteins here. And, you know, certainly, you know, for example, with PD-1 therapy, which is on the forefront of many tumor types, we now want to look at, at T cells. We want to look at, you know, immunochemistry. How does that fit in, and how is in this need to multiplex and have one platform, where, does, where do the proteins and the immunochemistry fit in? Uh, two really good questions. Uh, briefly on the driver gene question, the, the long tail uh, graphs that, that, um, that uh, Vince showed were, um, were illustrative of the fact that they're, they're actually, that tail could contain low frequency, you know, less than 5% or 3% or, or, uh, drivers that we really just haven't, they haven't come bubbled up to us because they're unfamiliar. So we tend to, one of the reasons why we discover the same drivers over and over again is because we recognize them. You know, there are always uh, recurrently mutated genes that we don't recognize. You look at every single list of every TCGA and other large scale paper, there are other recurrently statistically significant genes that we just blow off because we don't understand. And in that long tail, there could be a lot of those things. So I think that the, the short answer is we don't really know, but the long tail means that we're going to have to have a way of continuing to just 
collect. As more and more genomes are sequenced, uh, again, I think central registries are a great, a great way as when, once we get into the thousands, we can really get statistics around that tail and understand how many drivers really are there and, and what fraction can, do we have to say, this is a driver but we really don't understand. So, that, so that, that, that's one issue. The protein side, completely agree. We just need the technology and there are some exciting advances and things like MRM, but we, the technology is just has, has not quite matured to the point where it's just digital and it, you can plug and play, so, but it's very important. So I'm just going to just uh, follow up the Roy's question. It very, I, I just didn't have time to present the case today, but our, our second whole genome actually turned out to be even more interesting than our first whole genome. Um, and this was a patient who was cured, in fact, on one of our um, combination chemotherapy plus targeted agents phase one trials with advanced metastatic disease. And, and talk about an outlier, that, that simply does not happen. And it turned out that she had a gene, um, and we bi biologically validated that this was the cause. Um, in one of the DNA repair um, sort of pathways. Uh, and this was a gene that was not on our 300 gene assay. So it's one that we didn't have in the top 300 possible cancer genes. And by doing the whole genome analysis, we were able to pull out this gene, um, RAD50, as one that wasn't at the top of the list in our opinion. But I think the key aspect to that is we would not have pulled this gene out um, because this patient had 19,000 somatic mutations in her genome. Unless we had the phenotype of her complete response to this combination of therapies that pointed to this particular mutation as being important. So I think things like the TCGA are great. And I think there are a lot of drivers that, that are in the TCGA data, but nobody's pulled out because they're rare and they're not recurrent. Um, and so the way you figure out these genes or drivers or not in their new ACA genes is going to have to shift towards having some clinical or phenotype or clinical link that tells you that that particular mutation was important as opposed to what we've been doing, which is sequence 150 or 200 genomes um, and then just find the most common and then in the laboratory validate those. So uh, I think we're going to find more, but they're going to be rare things. All right. Well, I think maybe we'll take a break, uh, 15 minutes, and then we'll reconvene for a final panel session for today. Thanks.